Hello. In this week's Torah portion, Pereshit, we read about the wonder of the creation of the worlds. Quote, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Where did the light come from? The Midrash tells us that God looked into the Torah and created the worlds. So the light came from the Torah. In the book of Isaiah, God told us to spread that light. Quote, I, the Lord, have called you to be a light to the nations. Unquote. How are we to spread that light? Many believe it is through the concept of tikkun olam, the repair of the worlds, making the world a better place. Tikkun olam has become a very popular notion, especially since the 1980s, in non-traditional Jewish circles, in the sense of engaging in social action, espousing progressive causes, encouraging political correctness, and so forth. But what does this concept really mean? It turns out that five meanings for tikkun olam have surfaced in the evolution of Judaism. The very first is in the Mishnah, going beyond the law to prevent undesirable consequences. Let me explain. The early rabbis rendered rulings which they described as being mipnei tikkun haolam, for the sake of the repair of the world. These rulings were not commanded by the Torah. They went beyond strict commandments, but they were deemed necessary to keep order in the world. Let us examine three examples. The first example is the half-slave. A man dies and leaves a slave to his two sons. One does not believe in slavery and sets him free, but the other wishes to keep him. Bet Hillel ruled that the slave must work for his master half the time and is free the other half. But Bet Shammai disagreed, because then the slave would not be able to marry and procreate. He could not marry a free woman <coughs> because he is half slave, and he could not marry a slave woman because he is half free. The Talmud says, Bet Shammai said, and if you say the slave should not marry, isn't it true that the world was created only for procreation? As it says in Isaiah, God did not create the world to be a waste. He formed it to be inhabited. Rather, for the betterment of the world, we forced his master to free him, and the slave writes a bill to his master pledging to pay half his value to him. And Beth Hillel ultimately retracted their opinion to rule in accordance with the statement of Beth Shammai, that the half-slave must be set free." Unquote. So, the second brother is forced to set the slave free, and the slave commits to paying him back half his value. This is a rare example where Bet Shammai prevails. Bet Hillel was not willing to go beyond the Torah, which does not force such an outcome. The second example is about redeeming the captive. The Mishnah says, the captives are not redeemed for more than the actual monetary value in the slave market, mipnei tikkun haolam, for the betterment of the world, unquote. This means that even a rich relative is not allowed to pay more, because that would encourage more kidnappings and games of chicken with the lives of the captives. The third example is posbul. The Talmud says, quote, Hillel instituted a document called Posbul that prevents a debt from being cancelled on the sabbatical year, Mipnei Tikkun Haolam, for the betterment of the world. Unquote. Now, the Torah says that debts to individuals must be cancelled on the seventh year. The Posbul loophole writes in the loan contract that they will become debts to the court in the seventh year, and therefore not cancellable. This encouraged the rich to continue to lend to the poor without fearing the loss of their money. Thus, the original meaning of tikkun olam is going beyond what the Torah requires in order to prevent undesirable consequences and thereby improve the world. The second meaning of tikkun olam is the abolition of idolatry in the world. In the second half of the Alenu, which we recite at every service, we hope for the day when we will be able to perfect the world under God's kingship. Letaken olam bemalchut shaddai. Here, tikkun olam is clearly associated with the abolition of idolatry and the universal recognition of God. The prayer says, quote, Therefore we put our hope in you, Lord our God, that we may soon see your mighty splendor, when detestable idolatry will be removed from the earth, 
and when false gods will be utterly cut off. We hope for the day when the world will be perfected under the kingship of the Almighty, then all humanity will call upon your name, and the world's inhabitants will recognize and know that to you every knee must bend and every tongue of our loyalty. As it is written in the book of Zechariah, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. On that day the Lord shall be one, and his name one. Unquote. The only meaning implied here is the abolition of idolatry. Nothing else. The third meaning of Tikkun Olam is the gathering of the divine sparks that are spread out in the world. In the 16th century, Isaac Luria, the great mystic, taught that at the time of creation, God created ten vessels that held divine sparks of holiness. Sin caused them to burst, and the sparks spread over the entire world. Jews were then made to wander far and wide, just so they could gather these sparks of holiness and make them available to all. This is the needed repair. Luria writes, quote, And when enough holy sparks have been gathered, the broken vessels will be restored, and Tikkun Olam, the repair of the world awaited for so long, will finally be complete. Therefore, it should be the aim of everyone to raise these sparks from wherever they are imprisoned and to elevate them to holiness by the power of their soul." Unquote. The main lesson here is that individual actions can affect the fate of the entire world. The fourth meaning of Tikkun Olam is simply to perform all the commandments in the Torah. This is the understanding of traditional Judaism. The way to Tikkun Olam is to perform all commandments both ritual and ethical. The more performance, the closer the world will move towards perfection and towards the Messianic age. A notable example is the observance of Shabbat. The Babylonian Talmud says, Rabbi Yohanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, if all Jews kept two Shabbatot according to all the laws of Shabbat, the redemption would come immediately. The Jerusalem Talmud goes even further. The son of David, that is the Messiah, will come if Jews keep just one Shabbat, because Shabbat is equivalent to all the, com the commandments. The Midrash agrees. Rabbi Levi said, if Israel kept Shabbat properly even for one day, the son of David, the Messiah, would come. Contemporary Hasidic Rabbi Yitzhak Aharon Korf, chaplain of the city of Boston, adds, quote, Mitzvot include not simply socially or politically correct precepts, such as giving charity and engaging in political action, but also observance of Shabbat, dietary restrictions, daily prayer, and other commandments. Some substitute the false panacea of Tikkun Olam for the authenticity of true Judaism. To avoid their actual responsibilities as Jews to observe the Torah and the commandments. The only honest and authentic Jewish way to engage in Tikkun Olam is to encourage observance of the Torah across the entire spectrum of the Jewish community." Unquote. The fifth and last meaning of Tikkun Olam is performing good deeds and acts of kindness for the world. As mentioned, non-traditional Jews have enthusiastically put this understanding of Tikkun Olam at the center of their philosophy, giving it the meaning of emphasizing justice, philanthropy, and social action. In practice, they do it in a secular manner, excluding all religious underpinnings. They may quote Isaiah, learn to do good, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, bring justice for the orphan, seek defense for the widow. There are many critics of this approach, even among the non-Orthodox. One of them, Joel Alperson, who is past national chair, chair, campaign chair for what is now Jewish Federations of North America, wrote in an article entitled Judaism is More Than Tikkun Olam, quote, Jews are increasingly trying to find their Judaic meaning in social and political causes, such as immigration reform, Supreme Court appointments, environmentalism, women's rights, etc. Putting aside the merit of the positions taken, let's be honest. These Tikkun Olam pursuits might feel good and even do some good, but they do little to build Jewish communities. If Jews continue to prioritize these social and political efforts over proven religious practices, we must have the courage to acknowledge that we have substituted all these secular causes for Judaism. 
We might insist that tikkun olam and social justice are central to our Jewish way of life, but they are increasingly taking the place of serious Jewish education and Jewish practice. The modern Orthodox largely swim in the same secular waters as other Jews. They own televisions, use the internet, attend secular universities, and work and vacation in the secular worlds. But they also hold to a religious discipline that they believe is life-improving. They observe Shabbat and the Jewish holidays, and they study Jewish texts in far greater numbers than non-Orthodox Jews. They are more likely to have children, and their children are far more likely to marry Jews and make Jewish homes. It is the discipline of leading a traditional Jewish life that also reminds us how best to engage in repairing the world. Ironically, by overemphasizing tikkun olam, we could ultimately, through lack of Jewish knowledge and experience, lose the very impetus that put us in the tikkun olam business in the first place. We will be severely weakened if we don't acknowledge that we must repair ourselves far more urgently than we must repair the world. Time to conclude. The Torah has two sets of commandments, ritual and ethical. The ritual commandments preserve Judaism. The ethical commandments make Judaism worth preserving. Doing the ethical only, as in the last interpretation of Tikkun Olam, does nothing to preserve Judaism. It kills the goose with the golden eggs. As a Had Ha'am, the pre-Israel Zionist thinker, once said, more than Israel has kept Shabbat, has Shabbat kept Israel. So, a balance is needed. Maimonides wrote, Tikkun Olam requires hard work in all three pillars of Judaism, Torah study, acts of kindness, and the ritual commandments. Does this sound like a lot of work? The Mishnah answers this objection. Lo alecha hamlacha ligmor, you don't have to complete the task, but you may not desist from it entirely either. Shabbat Shalom.